Okay, welcome to section 2.3. So far this chapter, we started talking about slopes of tangent lines. And we noticed that involves the concept of limits. So what we've been doing here is focusing our attention uh, on limits of functions in general. And we'll, we'll come back and talk about slopes of tangent lines later, but we're not talking about slopes of tangent lines for a while. In section 2.2, we, uh, we introduced an informal definition of limits of functions and talked about how to compute limits uh, graphically and numerically. In section 2.3, we're going to talk about how to use the limit laws that we, that we discussed in class to compute limits algebraically. Um, I hope you, you, you've got two things so far out of limits. In this example right here, what we're really asking is, what is this expression getting close to as x gets close to 2 from both sides? Both sides have to agree, right? And also, we don't care what happens when x equals 2. Um, now, one question you should ask yourself right off the bat is what form does it have? In other words, what is the top getting close to and what is the bottom getting close to? In this case, the top is getting close to zero and so is the bottom. We say this limit has the form zero over zero. Um, anyway, factoring is, is a good te technique. Um, in this case, the top factors. And I guess the question I'd ask you is, can you cancel the uh, factors of x minus two? Is it legal? The answer is, of course, yes, because Remember, with a limit, we don't care what happens when x equals 2. So, in fact, you can assume x does not equal 2. So, these two expressions are equivalent. So, yes, you, you, you can cancel those factors. Now, to finish this problem, you, could, you can apply our limit laws now. Uh, the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, provided each limit exists. We also have some limit laws that talk about how to, the limit as x goes to a of x equals a. The limit as x goes to a of c equals c. So... So this, 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 this limit of this would equal 2, this limit is 5, so it's 2 plus 5 is 7. But we also have a better uh, property in Stewart called the direct substitution property. Since this is a polynomial, the, the limit's going to equal the function value. However you get there, the answer is 7. Now notice, even though the form was 0 over 0, the limit turned out to be 7. This, that's why we call this an indeterminate form, folks, because when, when it has the form 0 over 0, you don't know what it is. The limit could be anything. In this case, it's 7. All right, let's continue. This next example, we have the limit as uh, h goes to 0 of 1 plus h cubed minus 1 over h. Okay, what form does it have? Well, the top is getting close to 0, and so is the bottom. So again, we have that indet indeterminate form 0 over 0 again, which is pretty common, by the way. Think algebraically here. Uh, if you multiply the top out, you could use this formula. Every cal calculus student should know how to multi how multiply out the cube of a binomial. Anyway, you get this, and I think the ones cancel, and you can factor the h out. Now notice also, when you're computing these limits algebraically, always keep the limit sign. Uh, don't drop it. If you drop it, I'm going to mark off. Okay? You can cancel the h's, because we don't care what happens when h equals zero. And what's left happens to be a polynomial function, so by the direct substitution property is just going to be 3 plus 0 plus 0, which is 3. Or, if you don't like that, um, you could apply the limit laws. This, uh, this is going to be the, the sum of the limits, and, and, and um, since each limit exists, and also the three factors out of the limit. So this would be 3 plus 3 times 0. And uh, this, you, there, we have another limit law that says the limit as x goes to a of x to the n is a to the n. So this, this, this limit would equal 0 to the 2. However you get there, the answer is 3. Again, the, the form was, an indi was the indeterminate form 0 over 0. The limit turned out to be 3. Okay, let's do some more. Okay, in this next example, we have the uh, limit as x goes to 0 of square root of x plus 4 minus 2 over x. Now, another trick that's helpful is to sometimes use the con conjugate. The conjugate of a minus b is a plus b. And what, what's so nice about that is if either a or b happens to be a square root, when you, when you multiply a number by its conjugate, you won't, you won't have a square root in your answer. Because it's a squared minus b squared. So in this case, but b before we use the conjugate, let's ask ourselves, what form does this have? Well, top is getting close to 0, so is the bottom. So again, we have the indeterminate form 0 over 0. So when you multiply by the conjugate of the top, you get this. Now, when you multiply it out, notice you're going to get x plus 4 minus 4. The bottom, you get x times the quantity, square root of x plus 4 plus 2. And the 4's cancel. 
you can cancel the x's because we don't care what happens when x equals zero. So we're down to this step, okay? Now, we can apply our limit laws. Uh, we have a limit law that says you can take the limit of the top over the limit of the bottom provided both limits exist and the bottom limit is not zero. The reason why the bottom limit exists is because you can take the limit of each one and remember we have a limit law that says you, you can pull the limit inside of the square root provided um, the limit exists and it's greater than zero. Well what's inside the square root is just is getting close to zero plus four so the limit exists and it's greater than zero. So you can apply your, your, your limit, limit laws to that and you end up with 1 over square root of 0 plus 4 plus 2, which is 1 fourth. Okay. Look at it. Let's look at this one here. In this problem, uh, what form does it have? Let's see. The top is getting close to 1 minus 1, which is 0, and so is the bottom. My advice here is to just think about it algebraically. Let's just try to simplify this expression. So let's get rid of the negative exponent. Then let's get the LCD on the top, which is 1 plus h, right? Anyway, so you multiply top and bottom of the second term by 1 plus h. Careful when you, uh, when you do that, you uh, have to dis distribute the negative sign to each term. And when you divide by h, don't you multiply by 1 over h? Notice I, I kept the limit sign on each step. I don't want to get marked off for that. So when you multiply the top out carefully, you, you get this you get a uh, minus one minus h on the top and the ones cancel and I believe the h's are going to cancel too, right? Here, the h's cancel. So what you end up is, is this. Now you can apply your limit laws. The top limit exists, the bottom limit exists. So, so you can take the limit of the top or the limit of the bottom. Or you could apply the direct su substitution property here as well. So the answer is going to be negative one over one plus zero which becomes negative one. Okay, in this next example, we've got the limit as x goes to 1 of the absolute value of x minus 1 over x minus 1. So what form does it have? Well, the top is getting close to 0 and so is the bottom. So it has that indeterminate form 0 over 0. Whenever you have a limit using uh, absolute values, it's nice to go back to the definition here. Remember the definition of absolute values? The absolute value of x is equal to x if what's inside the absolute values is uh, greater than or equal to 0. And it's going to be the opposite of x if what's inside the absolute values is less than zero. So in this, in this case, the absolute value of x minus 1 turns out to be x minus 1 if x minus 1 is greater than or equal to zero, which is the same thing as saying x is greater than or equal to 1. It's going to equal the opposite of the quantity x minus 1 if x minus 1 is less than zero, which, which is exactly the same thing as saying x is less than 1. So the absolute value function is really a piecewise function and it, it makes sense to break up this limit and look at each case se separately and see if both sides agree. Seem like a plan? So, um, so when you look at the limit as x goes to 1 from the right, then, then what's inside the absolute value is going to be positive. So you can, you can just um, take away the ab absolute value bars. You could replace uh, the absolute value of x minus 1 with x minus 1. When you compute the limit, uh, the x minus 1's cancel, you just have a limit as x goes to 1 of 1, which is, which is 1. On the other side, if we're assuming x is going, limit as x goes to 1 from the left, what's inside the absolute value bars is going to be neg negative. So you're going to replace the absolute value of x minus 1 with negative the quantity x minus 1. So uh, the limit as x goes to 1 from the left, the x minus 1's cancel, but you have a limit as x goes to 1 from the left of negative 1, which is negative 1. And therefore the limit doesn't exist because um, the right and left side don't agree. By the way, the graph of this function look, looks like this. And what, what's going on there, folks, is you have a jump. Okay, we've we got time for one more. Um, okay, in this last example, what form does it have? Uh, actually, the top is getting close to 0, the bottom is getting close to 2. This has the form 0 over 2, which is not an indeterminate form. This whole limit is, 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 is going to be 0. Now, how would you use your, your limit laws on this? Well, uh, the, the slickest way to do it is to use the direct substitution property because this is a rational function, but 1 is in the domain, so you can just plug in the function value. The answer is 0 over 2, which is 0. However, you, you could have also used the uh, limit laws and said it's the limit of the top or the limit of the bottom. Then you could have taken the limit of each piece on the top and, and shown that that limit is, is going to be 0, and the limit of each piece on the bottom and show that that, that limit's 2. You still end up with 0 over 2, which is 0. 
All right, and we'll see you in class tomorrow. Bye-bye.